Have you tried Music to Code by yet? Well, why not? Here's a comment Joe left on the website. This is also great music to mow by. I like listening to music while doing yard work to help the monotony of it seem less tedious. This past summer, I started listening to these tracks while doing yard work, and they worked great! I could let the music play in the background without focusing on it, and it seemed to help me concentrate on getting through my tasks. Thanks, Joe. And you know, now you can download the entire 13-track collection. That's over five and a half hours of music to code by for only 39 bucks. Check it out at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And uh, we're here in the fishbowl again. We're going to do a lot of shows from here. It's going to be a busy day. Not that anybody's going to be able to tell. Right. We're recording six shows today. Something like that, yeah. So it's going to be a long day. But they're going to be spread over over several weeks. Right. The question you'll have to ask, maybe that we, we should just put that out to the listeners right now. Mm. Try and figure out what the sixth show was that we record this uh, day. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that'll be a Can you one. tell? Yeah. Because we'll probably be a little brain fried. Just well, guessing. you know, and if we're time shifting, it was two months ago that we recorded this show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we don't remember either. I don't know. I won't know if I don't remember. I guess that's, that's true. two months from now. Right. All right. Well, anyway, let's roll the music for Better Know a Framework. Awesome. All right, dude, what do you got? I went looking for some Windows 10 APIs. Mm, you're going to do a little framework in your Better Know a Framework. Yeah, I know. Who Look knew? Strangest thing. Yeah, who knew? And uh, in Windows 10 in UWP land, mm -hmm. there's this idea of UI framework layering. Okay. So there are three layers to user interface. At the very top is the framework layer, which is where your XAML, you know, Windows UI XAML is, controls, layout, markup, sure. accessibility, data binding. Down one layer is, well, the bottom layer is the DirectX family, like right. the graphics layer. Drawing to the, to the video card. The actual, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in between is this windows.ui.composition layer. Hmm. And this is called the visual layer. And this is where you get um, content, which is lightweight compositing of custom drawn content, mm -hmm. effects, which are real time UI effects. And I went looking and they're different from the media effects, but um, these are like. Transparency? Transparency, okay, yeah. uh, sepia tone. Interesting, uh, okay. Uh, bl blurring and blending, this right. kind of effect. All, all the stuff that when you do it well, you can't even tell it's happening. Right, right. right. Yeah. And animations, which are either keyframe animations, implicit animations, or expression animations, which is a new type of uh, animation introduced with the Windows 10 November update. Um, in the build 10.586. And, and there you can create a mathematical relationship between visual properties and discrete values that get evaluated and updated every frame. Interesting. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a way to use expressions to animate over time. Just to, and sort of give visual cues to what's going on. You know, it, it yeah. makes me think back to that build show we did not that long ago right. about the whole fluent UI. Exactly, right? exactly. So That's these are probably elements of what's where Fluent UI is going to come from. Yeah, and it, it, you know, it's just kind of cool because you know these are things that you think of like in Photoshop. Sure. Not in an app, you know, UI app building And thing. in some respects, just going to get for free when you're working with control suites and things and, right. and uh, software development. Yeah, so. yeah. And the ultimate idea is that, you know, at the top layer, at the XAML layer, you'll be able to just turn these things on and off. That's cool. Yeah, very cool. Right, neat, fine, so man. that's what I got, the visual layer today. I uh, like it a lot. Who's talking to us, buddy? I grabbed a comment off of show 1041, so I've dove back into the archives. That's September of 2014. We talked to Ben Watson mm -hmm. about making .NET perform. Yeah. And we talked a fair bit of logging, especially event tracing for Windows, which we're going to dig back into. And it's important to, you know, ETW has been around a long time. Yeah. This show's three years old. Yeah. And what caught me when I was reading the comments about this is just how far we've come to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the comment that really caught my attention here was from Bo Jordan, who mm -hmm. said, Kathleen Dollard also mentioned it, but the semantic logging application block, that's slab.codeplex.com, <laughs> slab. offers a great wrapper around the event source in ETW for .NET development, and if you don't want to use the semantic part of slab, it can be a great introduction 
to using ETW. Mm. The problem, of course, is it was on CodePlex, which means it got moved to GitHub, yeah. but it went directly to the Microsoft Archive okay. uh, on GitHub. And so it uh, looks like last contributions were a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So this looks like it uh, might be a little dated. I suspect our guest has better information she probably about does. what the modern libraries look like there. Yeah. But I wanted to bring it up because... ETW has been around a long time. Right. There's been several different tools that have come and gone along the way. And this one, of, I'll still include a link to it because obviously it's there. Mm. You know, you can always download and use it. It's not a big deal. And maybe it's just done. Yeah, maybe. Right? It just works. Right. Uh, but Bo, thanks for the little flashback. You know, even though he made that comment three years ago, a .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media. We publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. They really enhance our visual layer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that brings us to our guest today. Dina Goldstein is a senior software engineer at Riverbed. Riverbed builds performance monitoring tools that run on millions of PCs and mobile devices. Dina is on the team responsible for the core collection mechanism, which hooks low-level Windows events and collects performance information from a variety of sources. Since starting at Riverbed, she worked a lot on boot performance monitoring, identifying bottlenecks in the Windows boot process, and on monitoring user experience on the web. Welcome, Dina. Hi, hello. So happy to be here. Oh, we're happy to have you. I haven't heard the name Riverbed in a while. Yeah. Uh, their original their original device, what was it called? Was it called Steelhead? It was a yes. device for accelerating WAN connections to exchange yes, servers? Yes, yes. actually They just acquired us. Uh, originally, I worked for uh, Eternity. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, and now we're part of the... Gosh, I hope I'm correct about this. <laughs> <laughs> now we're part Remember of the... Remember when you used to work for the company? <laughs> <laughs> now we're part of the... I think it's called Still, Still Central... Gosh, something. Okay. <laughs> this is embarrassing. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's a new acquisition, <laughs> okay. you know? Yeah. You know who went to Riverbed many, many years ago? It was a Microsoft guy by the name of Steve Riley. Oh, yeah, Steve he was Riley. A, he was a security guy. Right. He went over, I think he was in the office of CTO of Riverbed way back when. But mm. That was much more network focused. So what did Eternity do? Yes, yeah, so Eternity does application performance monitoring ah, okay. mm. uh, with an emphasis on user experience. So the idea is that, well, our clients, our, our customers, our IT uh, departments of large corporations mm -hmm. like banks, uh, health industry, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that they want to monitor, uh, how do you call it? Let's call it their business activities. Sure. So, for example, a bank teller needs to get into an account or maybe like a health insurance uh, company needs to update some Mm. you know, form or whatever. And so they want to monitor how their uh, specific business applications uh, perform. So we provide them the ability to define those business activities mm -hmm. and monitor their performance. Okay. And again, the emphasis is user experience. So it's not about CPU usage percentage or, or memory usage, although we can monitor that as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, like, the unique thing is that we can measure, for example, the time that it takes from the moment the bank teller uh, you know, clicks the uh, open account button mm. until the time that the screen with all of the uh, customer's information is actually there displayed for the teller to see. And, and is this the same tool that you're that Riverbed is you're talking about in, in your yeah, bio? So here, that, this core that's what Riv yeah, that's what Riverbed uh, acquired. Right, <laughs> right. Um, well, and it may, I mean, they've been an instrumentation company for a long time. This is just broad in that instrumentation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That, that to me sounds really interesting. Do you, so do you actually write some code to indicate workflows yeah, so that you so can measure those things? Yeah, so the there's a, a pretty complicated XML uh, format. Ah, uh, great. We love XML. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, the IT, the, like the people don't have to use XML. We also provide designer tools, right. which allow to visually kind of drag and drop, select uh, certain events, mm -hmm. um, and kind of compile the, the activity. The way it works is that first you do a recording mm -hmm. of your business uh, transaction. So do the workflow? Yeah. yeah. And then our tool like kind of records everything. Right. And yeah. then you get this table where you can search for events and you see the video at the same time. And so, oh, there's an event here of clicking a button. And you can see on the screen uh, 
which button was clicked. And so you can say, well, this is the start yeah. of my business transaction. And then, you know, suddenly you can see that a uh, screen, a sort of window appears. Yeah. And so you see that that's the correct window and you say, okay, well, that's the end of my transaction. Mm. And, you know, you can also specify uh, conditions which cause the transaction to fail or, you know, yeah. stuff like that. And we also support monitoring web stuff. Um, because like the examples that I just gave there for Windows uh, uh, UI applications, mm -hmm. yep. but everything is moving into web. So we also have... Uh, Instagram web is just that much trickier. Yeah, pretty yeah. good support for web stuff as well. Absolutely. Do you guys remember CBT? The CBT API it was called computer-based training. Oh, yeah. And it was a way that you could record mouse and keyboard events and then play them back. Hmm. To do, you know, and I think that might be what Microsoft Test was based on. I don't know. But there, there are several such frameworks. I, I haven't used one myself, but but it's similar in the sense that it starts by recording uh, making what recording. what users do, and you know, then we take it to the performance monitoring right. uh, uh, place. Other products take it maybe to testing. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, there's a testing framework uh, called Testim IO. Mm -hmm. um, and so they do that on the web. They can record whatever it is that you do on your website, but then you use it for unit testing. Absolutely. Ah, neat. So that's a custom tool, and obviously probably for sale through Riverbed these days. But ETW, that's a built-in logging bit. Do you guys lean on ETW for part of that functionality? Yes, for some, for s that's one of our data sources. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. One of the reasons, I mean, like you, s you know, uh, like you said in my uh, when you read my bio, mm -hmm. uh, we do win uh, you, uh, win API hooking and stuff like that. But mm. that's very invasive, and of course, our main goal is to do as little damage as we can. Invasive? Sure. You mean it slows things down and it gets in the way? Yeah. Um, not even just slow down, but just like it's uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> well, <Okay. laughs> you're adding when code. you yeah when when you hook APIs yeah. and you don't know how to do it correctly. Right. I mean, of course, we try to do the best that we can, but right. mm. things go wrong, and uh, a lot of times we encounter problems when there are several products mm -hmm. that hook the same API, and it actually happens, and then they start you know getting in each Fighting other's way. Each other. Like yeah. if one of them doesn't do it completely correctly, then bad things happen, yeah. and applications crash. And and our first rule is to never ever never crash. Break the app. Uh, yeah, never <laughs> ever break, break the, the customer. We carefully <laughs> measured breaking your app. That's <laughs> not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do no harm. The Hippocratic um, oath of software. Yeah. So yeah. of course we try to do the best we can to use tools and information, data sources that don't, that can't cause any any yeah. damage. Well, and, in the, and <laughs> so to, to be grabbing from the ETW pipeline is to actually be out of the context of the app entirely. Yes, so absolutely. no chance you're going to harm Absol the app that absolute, way. Absolutely, absolutely. Although I do have an anecdote about this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. I don't remember the exact context. I think it was before I started working there. Um, but I did hear a story about how turning on a specific uh, ETW provider caused a blue screen. Oh, so, yeah. That's, so, like, that's Microsoft. <laughs> that's not <laughs> yeah, you so, guys. Yeah, right. that's. Uh, <laughs> it's very sad though because a lot of times it's not our fault. Sure, like but you're a still lot of get times, blamed. exactly. A lot of times it's another application getting in the way, or another application not hooking correctly, yeah. or this you know Microsoft API causing a blue screen. And technically, it's not our fault. But the point is that if they stop our application, it doesn't happen. So it's crash anymore, so, so therefore it's your fault. Right? So it's not about fault. It doesn't matter, no. even if they sure. don't blame us. The you yeah, know still, <laughs> still the result is the result. The result yeah. is the result, and yeah. so so EDW might be at times problematic as well. But generally, um, you generally it's, don't it's expect safer. an EDW provider to crash. The yeah, machine. of course, that's, that's of course. You would hope. <laughs> one would hope. <laughs> uh, but yes, definitely, it's one of the sources. Um, specifically, we get uh, network information from EDW, yeah. and. Uh, as as we already said, I was investigating boot performance using ETW. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say network information, what are we talking about? Um, you know what? I have <laughs> I have to admit, I'm not sure how much I can disclose. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, wow. I, I don't think it's a big secret. Right. <laughs> um, but network network traffic. Okay. Sure. So packet sizes, like how much data yeah, you're moving? Stuff, yeah, stuff like that. Okay. Because we're actually able, and that's also a nice feature, along with the time that these user transactions take, 
like say from clicking the button until the screen appears. Right. And it's especially relevant for web uh, applications, sure. but not only anything that talks mm. to a server, we can also say how much network traffic there was right. during that time. Right. So you can sort of figure out how you know what your minimum Maybe. bandwidth requirements might be for an application or something in order in order to get a, a good experience. Yeah, I mean, we don't try to figure out stuff. <laughs> we just, you just <laughs> we just, it. no, we just, you know, we just display dashboards right, the for the clients. But the I point see. is that if they detect using our dashboards that there is suddenly a problem, you know, in some in yeah. some user uh, activity, uh, they can start, you know, drilling down, getting more information. Oh, maybe like traffic, or network traffic was high here. Right. Maybe it or has something to latent. do with that. Yeah. You know, you sh you, you took yeah, a long and time we, to we break down out. the information sure. actually into like you no know, lower level details. Well, yeah. in, in the end, the user doesn't call and say, I'm having a problem with network latency. They say, the app is slow. Yes. And you're trying to figure out, well, is yes. it service on the back end? Yes. Is it connectivity? Yes, and that's why it all starts like with the start of the user activity and the end. Sure. And we can, you know, display a holistic view of what was going on I'd be that lucky time. if my users said the app is slow you know usually they say it's not working right <laughs> thanks thanks it's I great. don't know yeah. what's worse though because when it's w when it's not working they can tell you specifically this <laughs> is not working as it should have but yeah. like my app is slow what are yeah. you supposed to do it's with that? It's a very subjective thing, right? So Slow compared to what? Yeah. <laughs> so is the mi is the big picture here to try to get an idea of of how users are interacting with the software and therefore how you can improve the software or improve the interactions or again is that's it not really up to us because we're just a monitoring tool yeah. but <laughs> so is that what it's used for it can be mm -hmm. uh, it depends on what you monitor i think one of the other strengths of our product is that you don't have I mean, you can use it on any application mm. we can monitor outlook and word and excel and powerpoint it doesn't we don't provide an API that you need to incorporate right. into your application. We actually do have an API that you can use, mm. uh, and you know, to if you know, make even more data available yeah. for the dashboards. But we can monitor any application from the oh. outside, and and so the idea is just monitoring. Right. But for example, what what the IT department can use for uh, with such a thing is. Uh, for example, I mean, in such large corporation, mm -hmm. it's problematic to deploy updates, right. whether it's Windows updates or, you know, your uh, ap Just application. Just because the sheer volume of data you're talking Yeah, or an application yeah. uh, update or mm -hmm. even your own uh, in-house uh, developed application. Mm -hmm. sure. And so, for example, what, what you could do is to kind of define a test, right? right? Let's take this group of computers, deploy our update to that group, monitor it for a while. If everything is okay, then we feel safe yeah. to, you know, to deploy the sure. update to the entire, uh, to the entire uh, corporation. Mm. You can also get views, um, for example, based on, on location. So maybe, you know, our application works great in Europe, but it works, you know, like really bad in the States. And, sure. you know, maybe the reason is that the servers are located in different locations. And, yeah. right. You know, there's some latency or whatever. But now that's up to the IT department They've to figure they out. They still got to do the diagnosis. But the, but the thing is that they have all the data there to try to figure out what's different. Yeah. And uh, Dina, hold that thought right there while we take a minute to pay the bills. This episode of .NET Rocks is made possible in part by Windows on the Google Cloud Platform. You may not know this, but the Google Cloud Platform supports Windows Server 2008, 2012, and 2016. It also supports SQL Server versions 2012, 2014, and 2016 standard web and enterprise editions with high availability. You can deploy your ASP.NET Windows apps to Compute Engine or your ASP.NET Core apps to App Engine or Container Engine. That's Google's hosted Kubernetes environment. .NET and .NET Core libraries are there for all 200 plus Google.com and cloud services in NuGet, led by John Skeet of Stack Overflow fame. But what about Visual Studio integration? Oh, it's there. You can use Visual Studio to manage your GCP resources and deploy your existing apps. You get stack driver logging, error reporting, and tracing support for .NET and .NET Core. PowerShell commandlets for GCP, which run on Windows and Linux. And a great set of partners to bring your Windows and .NET workloads to GCP, including Capgemini, Nudesic, and Magenic. So go to gcp.netrocks.com and get your free trial today. 
And you're listening to .NET Rocks. This is uh, Carl Franklin and Richard Campbell. We're here with Dina Goldstein talking about event tracing for Windows and uh, all the things that you do with it. And I was looking up event tracing for Windows, you know, in the MSDN documentation, mm -hmm. and it's really a C++ library. It's, it is. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, as everything in Windows, it's, I guess that's uh, true, with right? the, it's, you know, it's a Windows API. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, we do have, a, we, Microsoft does have <laughs> a .NET wrapper for that. That's a good thing. It's uh, called Trace Event. It's uh, available on Nougat. Uh, nice. And uh, it's actually pretty convenient. It doesn't wrap everything from the C++ perfectly. Yeah. Um, but so far, I, I wasn't missing uh, anything that I needed. Yeah. So it does just more or less work. Because I guess you're, it's mostly about dealing with types and calls and just making it a little more friendly to the managed yeah. memory environment. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it provides uh, type-safe APIs for, uh, for a whole bunch of events. Mm. Um, you could also define your own uh, types uh, and to use it uh, to use it with the framework. Okay. And uh, when we obviously we mentioned the networking stuff that you grab off of ETW, but there's a lot of things that go through ETW. Yeah. So is, is it almost too much to list? Well, it's definitely too much for me to list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's you know I uh, in my talk just uh, what about half an hour ago mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I showed a screenshot. Of uh, of the dot of the uh, ETW providers on my Windows machine, right? And I showed just a tiny part of the list. And on, in fact, on my machine, I counted slightly over a thousand wow. different wow. providers. Yeah, wow. yeah, different providers, and each of them can be configured with different keywords okay. and verbosity level. Mm. So that's quite a lot of information. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yes, and. And the sad part is, it's really is sad, is that there's no documentation for oh, this. Oh, no. There's no, you know, concise list of... That's completely uh, unheard of. Yeah, why would that ever happen? That never <laughs> happens. <laughs> <laughs> Who would do that? <laughs> that seems so strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so everything you... It's like the internet. Everything you want to know is in there. You just can't yes, find it. So <laughs> <laughs> or Outlook. 57 <laughs> threads, not one for me. So it's really an, an, an amazing tool, um, but you have, you, know, you have to work right. to, to, get it, to, to get your information out of it. And this is the sort of the usual thing with logging. It's like huge amounts of data, not a lot of information. Like you Depends. really have to <laughs> narrow it down. Uh, yes. I mean, for example, what I do, uh, if I, you know, Let's say I have some scenario and I want to investigate if you know I can find something in right. ETW that's going to help me. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, someone from the audience asked me after the talk uh, if he can uh, get information about SQL Server locks right. and stuff like that. So, well, first of all, I don't do much uh, database development, so I'm not personally familiar with right. ETW and, and, and providers. And this is event tracing for Windows, not event tracing for. SQL Server, right? Uh, yes, that's right. But first of all, SQL Server obviously uses runs. some win yeah, you know, runs runs Windows. Windows. So. so by proxy, it has a lot uh, of stuff coming sure. from inside it. But actually, tools have ETW inside them. Right. I mean, I, it's all over .NET. You can monitor ASP.NET uh, requests. Um, I, I, in fact, a while ago, I found out that even Chrome emits ETW. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Yes. The there's Chrome a browser. There's, if you want, you, there's a configuration somewhere there. I don't okay. remember exactly where it is, but you can turn it on. So the Chrome guys have, have built a provider and you can switch it on. And, yeah. And yeah. It's actually yeah, definitely. Stream. So if I had to guess, I'm quite sure that SQL Server also has yeah, some data imagine. coming out of it. Um, but anyway, what I suggested uh, to this guy was, look, I don't know. I've never worked with uh, ETW and SQL Server. Right. Mm -hmm. What I would do... <laughs> And this is similar to what I did when I was investigating boot performance. Mm -hmm. First, go over the list of providers that you have on your machine. Right. Search for stuff that have SQL Server, DB, locks, you know, whatever keyword you can think of right. that might be relevant, right. uh, might be relevant to that. I really hope you'll be able to find something. Right. Then take I'm your. I'm going to uh, search right now. I'm just curious to see <laughs> ETW SQL Server. See what we get. Yeah. Then take your favorite uh, ETW recorder yep. and basically record everything, all the keywords, all the verbosity levels, all the providers that have to do with SQL Server. And now it's going to be hard work. You're going to have to start digging and going through these these events. Um, and you might find something that's helpful to you. You right. might not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't promise anything. Yeah. That's an interesting anything. truth, right? It's like. Yeah. 
the and, I, and there's the first link that came up was ETW and SQL Server 2005. Woohoo! Oh yeah, 12 <laughs> years old. <laughs> that's but. that's actually impressive. And uh, by the way, things. I mean, again, I don't know about SQL Server, but in Windows, for example, they keep adding log log messages right. from different places. So I, I don't remember now exact uh, exact uh, examples, but I do know in our product, for example, that some uh, log messages are available only in some of the Windows uh, with versions. Right. So it's quite possible that you wouldn't have enough information for an old SQL Server, but maybe there's you know more for a newer more one. data yeah. now. Sure. Uh, so then, question: You know, you want the run right way, right? Because I know SQL Server spits out logging in other ways as well. The question is: Is it the same data in all those places? Like, can I can I do ETW for everything? Well, I hope it's the same data, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm not convinced. I'm just saying. I'm not, and I'm not saying they're going to vary values so much as they're measuring different things. It doesn't have to be. After all, at the end of the day, uh, ETW is just another logging framework. Right, right. And I guess what kind if, of data is captured? If there's a captured? bug and you report uh, wrong data, either in your you know, regular log file or your ETW log, then, mm. you know, it's not the same data. Right. Uh, hopefully it is, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The ETW data, when you go in and look, this is the stuff that you see when you go into events in your, your uh, uh, administrative console for Windows, where they have sort of the critical, informational, like all those different modes. Is that ETW data? Um, so some of it is. Okay. I'm not sure about everything. Right. Uh, some of it definitely is. Um, specifically, I know, for example, about the boot profiling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an event. Uh, it's called uh, it, its ID is 100. Um, mm. ID 100. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and it has a lot of information. Uh, I'm not. I don't think actually there's a specific ETW event with this entire information. Mm. But I know for sure that the information displayed in this uh, event uh, message comes from. Uh, other ETW events, which are then compiled and like you know uh, mm. calculated into the metrics that right. you see in this event. Yeah. So it's definitely one of the sources. Okay. Yeah, and is there any structure to the data that comes in a given event? Yeah, that sounds like the consolidation of multiple events into one place. Uh, well, there is structure in the sense that all of the events have a play payload, which is kind of like a dictionary, a name, and data. Mm -hmm. But again, seeing there's no documentation, you can't know <laughs> right. in advance what's going to be there. So you record the data, and you start looking at it. It, yeah. it makes you wonder if there's just sort of anarchy in there. Like, really? No documentation? Maybe Microsoft has something internal. Uh, just not um, telling us. So <laughs> every provider, it's up to them to figure out what format yeah, they want to yeah. put the data in. Well, yeah. is that sort of the classic thing, right? right? They've got to make it flexible enough that everybody will use it because it's not an impediment. But then there's not a lot of control. So it's like, how yeah, you know useful what? I, is this I, data? I really? actually lied a little bit. No? Come, come to think of it. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, these providers, they have manifests. Right. Oh, and all right. the manifests, they do describe the structure. Yeah. But as for the meaning of some of these uh, yeah. properties, you might not understand it. I mean, there's no documentation in the sense that it doesn't explain the meaning of these fields. So right. you know there's field one, two, three. This one is a number, a string. The length is so on and so forth. You can even know the name. Mm. But sometimes the name, oh, let there be light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <laughs> um, sometimes you understand what the name means, mm -hmm. but sometimes you don't. Mm. Um, yeah, that's fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's also a performance monitor. It's, you know, as a guy who's done a lot of performance tuning over the years, there's some ETW data with this perfmon data, which is different. Mm. Yes. And they're, and they're equally valuable depending on what you're trying to diagnose. Yes, yes, yep. definitely. They're different, though, in the sense that uh, perfmon only pr performance counters, they only provide numeric data. Right, yeah. So they're very useful, but yeah. they don't have the same strength sure. as EDW. No. I, I think the ideal would be, though, to use them both because, right. for example, let's say you want to monitor high CPU usage. Mm -hmm. Although ETW is, has pretty good performance, mm -hmm. still, it's not, uh, it's not realistic to monitor all CPU stacks uh, right. You know, all the time right. in your production. Where Perfmon absolutely does that. Yeah. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, I must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time to search our ETW log for humorous events in .NET Rocks. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
Is it possible to have a negative number of entries? <laughs> <laughs> the, okay, well, now you got one. <laughs> Exactly. No, now it's zero because it was minus one. Before. Oh, I see. Ah, that's okay. what I'm getting at. It's actually time to give away a D Experience subscription from Developer Express to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express UI controls and libraries, and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today, and leverage your existing knowledge to build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. Learn more and download your free 30-day trial at devexpress.com slash superhero. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Ryan Brubaker. Congratulations, Ryan. Yes. I'll clap for you, sir. Yes. And Ryan just won the D-Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from our friends at Developer Express just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world, and every show we like to give away stuff from our sponsors, and every December we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of said fan club. But you have to sign up to win. And Dina, we'd like to ask you now, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? Yeah, so I know you told me to prepare for that question. You, you don't have to prepare. And I <laughs> thought about it long and hard. <laughs> I'm just not the gadget type. That's yeah. So right. the, the, the one thing I could think of, <laughs> it's very stereotypical. I once saw a video of a laundry folding machine. <laughs> wow. Oh, I saw that thing. Was it, was it the Robert robot? It's like this no, no. huge machine. No, no, I would need to buy like a larger apartment yeah. to fit that. <laughs> it's not practical, <laughs> but it is awesome. But okay. yeah, it's so awesome. So The Foldimate. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, the Foldimate. That's funny. <laughs> so I, I think I would totally go for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like to see that in action. It's, it's like very Jetsons, right? You just like shove Jetsons. shirts in one side and they come out. Yeah. I wasn't even sure other. it's a real thing. The, well, it's it's still in pre-order. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pre-order is starting in 2017. Only supposed to be about $1,000. Oh, really? Oh, really? So, okay, so, so in that case, I have more budget. <laughs> I have, no, it means I have more budget. <laughs> okay. And so the second thing I thought it was a 3D printer, okay. uh, which is yeah. really pretty cool. Yep. I mean, it's, I know it's not very original, but, uh, no, but no, it's, it's pretty fine. cool. It's, you know, it's interesting sort of 3D printers have waxed and waned a bit too. Mm -hmm. And the $1,000 the $1, 3D printers are not that fancy. But if you're spend, willing to spend two or 3000 I have four on the budget You do. Now. You do have four. <laughs> right. There's the, these laser resin deposit la uh, uh, 3D printers. They're pretty cool. But yeah, and I was thinking I can actually use the 3D printer to print all the other gadgets that I want. <laughs> I like that idea. See, that's very so you're meta. Going, you're going rep full Star Trek oh, replicator yeah. here. <laughs> that's the, as long yeah. as all your other gadgets are made of plastic, you'll be fine. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun when it's not like the money you had to earn. It's like, we're going to give you $5,000. What are you going to buy? Then we go a little more extravagant, too, because I've always wanted a 3D printer. I just find it tough to justify. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know how much it would actually get used. I, I would like a 3D printer, but not something that just makes brittle resin BS, you know, I'd like something that makes you know steel or something. Yeah. I was Laser actually, sintering machine. I was thinking more in the area of uh, printing organs. The, oh, oh, I see. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's going to be a little more than five thousand. That's a like five thousand yeah. dollars. Kind of Do a deposit on Do you have a need for organs <laughs> on a regular basis? You know, like maybe if I had more fingers to tie. There you go. <laughs> That's where I was going. Uh, or another eye uh, at the back, yeah, of, back my of my head. head. Nobody sneaks up on you? Yeah. <laughs> Put an eye right over both ears. You know? <laughs> that would be really cool. Then you could see what you're hearing. <laughs> All right. I'm pondering yeah. that. All right. Well, I'm a little, little shell-shocked now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, what about inserting your own, using ETW as your logging stream for your app? Yeah, so you can definitely do that. Okay. Uh, we don't do that, actually. Right. Um, but you definitely can. Mm -hmm. There are APIs uh, for that. For and, that. And, and I think it's a good idea, actually. I mean, mm -hmm. I definitely wouldn't, you know, go now and change the entire logging structure that sure. we have in our application. No, no. But if I were starting a new product, from scratch, I would definitely take monitoring into account. Sure. Mm. And having such a framework, such as ETW, and again, in conjunction with performance counters, because sometimes you just need numerical data. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
So I would definitely think about incorporating both of them uh, to make the DevOps guys, the production engineers' lives easier. There you go. Uh, event source class is just in the framework. Right. For writing events yeah, di sure. directly to the ETW stream. Yeah. What about, um, you know, we're, we were talking about the data and the format of the data, and we really like Serilog. You know, Nick Bloomhart was just on the show right. a couple of weeks, uh, last week. And we were talking about Serilog, which basically allows you to take a JSON object, essentially, and log it, you know, log it with, with typing. Mm -hmm. So you have, um, you know, you have, you have a richer kind of thing that you can log right out of your app. Take your objects in your app, serialize them, turn them into log entries. But, I, you know, that, would that really help in the ETW world? I mean... Because you're, you're well, it's the ETW, essentially, the ETW it's is collecting data. It's not something that you're going to use to push data down to the log, is it? Well, you can. If you're a provider, I suppose. If you're you, a provider, you push, yeah. you, you know, you push data. And it, it's actually, I mean, the, the format is not exactly the same, but essentially it's similar to mm. JSON in the sense that there's a dictionary mm -hmm. with keys yeah. and values. A manifest, you yeah, said. Yeah, a manifest. Yeah. So... So essentially, it is typed. Uh, yeah. These log messages, they're, they're structured log messages. Sure, sure. And you define the structure uh, right. of the payload. So again, so I mean, it, I don't know. If you didn't give me your structure, then I wouldn't know what your data looks like. Yeah. But like, if you give it to me, then I know how to parse it. And, mm -hmm. and all the log messages of the same event idea are going to have that same structure. Yeah. So. And it, you know, the, the strength of using ETW in that scenario for your apps, especially when you're in an enterprise environment, is you already have IT folks that are monitoring ETW streams mm. through stuff like uh, System Center Confer Operations Manager, yeah. right? Like, it, it, you're, no, you're not asking them to collect a new log to monitor your app. Right. You're asking them to yes. take on the log system they already have. Yes. And, and so, in an environment where you know there's people that are going to be doing monitoring, to be able to say, okay, well, no, you don't need a new log file, just watch for these events in the ETW stream. That's my app. That's, yeah. That saves yeah. people some headaches. Yes, definitely. And I think that the main advantage is that it, it can be turned on on demand yeah, and right. in a very fine-grained granularity. Yep. Um, and that's really the point of monitoring because, I mean, even, again, as I said, even though the overhead is relatively low, still, as you add more providers, more information, it, gets more expensive. it, it yeah. adds up. You can, you know, there's no way around it. Well, and throwing and my IT hat on, like as a guy who's done off span work, the, the advantage when you use ETW in this scenario is that I can reach out to remote machines and say, I want you to pick up these particular event classes of this condition and route them to this central resource. That's pretty powerful. Well, you don't have to write all that code, right? right so sure. Just because your app fed into that ETW stream, I immediately get all that remote control, yes. filtering, mm -hmm. centralized repository and tracking. Like that, yep. it's hard to it's argue. Hard to argue with that. If 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 that's the scenario you're in, there's a lot of software that never gets there, right? But you think about a large enterprise, I mean the kind of places that Riverbed's customers look like, this is probably the sort of stuff they need to look at. Yeah. Definitely. It's very cool. The the other question is what are you logging too? Like are we really just talking about errors? No, not at all. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, certainly errors are important, like firing off criticals to say, hey, I crashed. Yes. Or something bad is happening. Yes, of course. But I think that's actually less interesting for monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, if there's an error, well, you also have your application log. And, yeah. you know, if there's an error, then, you know, there's exception, whatever, you handle it. Right. Um, it's really more about performance monitoring. Yeah. Like right. if you have some queues in your system and you want to know their sizes, you want to know that events aren't dropped, right. you want to know the amount of strain on your system. Or you but just. But I would tend to go towards Perfmon for that because that's all numerical yeah, data. Yeah, so that's specific numeral. But right. you might have other stuff as well. Um, gosh, I don't know if you know if I give you a DNS uh, DNS request, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. you're writing an ASP.NET server, and you want to monitor the requests and how long they take. Sure, sure. There you so go. So you get you know uh, pairs of the request and how long it took. You, you know, the other thing I think about when I think about ETW over, say, Perfmon, is Perfmon just gives you a number. You don't know if that number's good or bad. Yeah, you know? true. Like, um, number of items in queue is 100. 
Is that a good thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, you wrote if you context. wrote the application, if it's your own application, yeah. then you probably know. You probably know. If it's something else, then you don't know, or just you know, with time, you gain more experience and yeah. insight about like when the system is acting badly. Right. If you know, if there's a when certain it, number of uh, and really, yeah. you got to see a number of events over time yeah. to actually make but sense and of yeah, it. Oh, and it went usually, up actually, here. exactly, Why? you're also interested about the change over time. Sure. Yeah. So, like, if you see that the queue is over at a hundred then yeah, it's probably, it's not probably good. okay or but if it keeps growing yeah, mm-hmm. we probably deal. have and this a is where problem. I think ETW might come into play like can I write smart enough software myself or yes I'm maintaining those performance monitors but I can now spit out an ETW warning message saying this queue's not draining or this queue's continuing to grow at this rate so that you're actually giving the monitoring person a hint that this is a potential problem or that, you know, the software is aware of an issue. That's an interesting idea. I mean, you know, monitoring things are, is great, but then having some logic to, to see, to, to alert you when something abnormal happens yeah. is a totally different thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and not, not counting on the operator to necessarily know yes. what's good, what's bad. And, and he, I can't, you know, Let's not live in a deluded world where we're actually watching those traces in advance before a problem happens. After the app crashes right. and you go back through these logs yeah. to see that the app was saying, help me, I'm in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. I'm running low on disk space. My queue is running out of control or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Because you can't do that with Perfmon unless mm-hmm. the Perfmon was yeah. already running. Right. ETW yes. ha- keeps the logs. So what I have in mind is that you actually continuously monitor your application using Perfmon, mm-hmm. some numerical values. Mm-hmm. And once you pass certain thresholds and you need further, deeper data and from inside what's going on, then you turn on you know, the big guns and you start your ETW collection. Because again, as I said, it's yeah. performant, yeah. but... It's not an infinite but amount it's, of But it's not, yeah, but it's not infinitesimal. And so you can detect that you are you know, approaching a problem right. using just the numerical data. And now that you are actually inside the problem, you can turn on the more extensive uh, logging framework sure. and get more information. You can get call stacks, you can get you know, type of objects, you can get a list of uh, queries, mm-hmm. whatever it is that your application does. If you're actually that well instrumented, you yes. have those options. Because Perfmon dialed up, like. Again, I've done enough web performance testing. When you start asking for second by second updates of a bunch of key metrics on our web server, you hurt the web server. Yeah, like the web server down. is affected by those measurements. Yeah. They they they're not free. No, There's, not at all. I'll, I'll go find the blog post on this because it's from a while ago. Again, I'm putting on the run as radio hat. There was this idea of a black box mode for Perfmon, where you're not measuring constantly. You're measuring every few minutes. So at least you have some sense of the state of the machine, but not second to yeah. second, mm. and it I has mean, lower impact. Yes, monitoring is is mostly about getting the big picture. Sure. Yeah. There's a, you, we have to distinguish between debugging, profiling, right. and monitoring. Yeah, mm. yeah. You can't do on production the same things you to do in development. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have to be able to see the big picture. And whether it's, you know, sampling whatever it is once a minute, it might be enough. Yep. Maybe you see that you're now getting close to something. Maybe it can be something dynamic. Right. Maybe mm-hmm. you can increase you the... Up. Yes. Maybe you can increase the, uh, the intervals, mm-hmm. uh, the frequency of monitoring. Yeah. So you can, you know, define rules of how much data you want to emit and how much overhead you're willing to take to occur, upon uh, your... Yeah. Uh, application. Not to derail the conversation a bit, but uh, he, the deadlocking story, did I, ever, I must have told it to you once or twice. Go I ahead. Had, had a production application at peak utilization, we'd have database deadlocks. So transactions were failing, customers were angry. And then uh, as the DBA in, in that particular scenario, I'm like, guys, these are deadlocks. These are caused by code that's being run at velocity. You just need to air handle and recover from these and we should be okay. And the devs are like, no, no, fix your database. Your database is broken. And I can't reproduce the scenario for anything. Hmm. Uh, so I finally get desperate enough that I'm going to turn on the perf monitor tools for SQL Server that I actually want a copy of every query coming out of the database during peak 
Mm. And this spits out a lot of data. So I'm like, I'm worried about filling discs and it's going to impact performance right. and it's only happening. Well, it sounds peak. like performance is bad anyway. Well, so what's a little more uh, Wait. logging? <laughs> so gear up for peak season, for that peak hour, turn the logging system on, no deadlocks. Shut it back off again. Deadlocks. What? Measuring well, it changed the rules. Yeah. The observer effect. That locks timing. You exactly. insert a slow, slow down using your, uh, your monitoring. Yep. Mm. Definitely happens. And so the developer said, hey, just leave it on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the solution. Just insert, just insert yeah. some sleeps in between the, uh, the calls to the queries. You're, you're not wrong. That's what we started doing until we eventually wow. found this was the particular order of problems and it was a, lock, a particular locking addition, but only at velocity. Wow. But it gave us a hint. You know, yeah. that, the sp that it was all about the speed. But yeah, it's funny how those diagnostic things, and they're so specific. Like, I'd love to be able to have a show where we just gave hard and fast rules about how to do all these things. Mm. It totally depends on the app. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's very, very tough to come up with a, with a consistent set of rules for any of these things. But it's, it's That's very fun. why we're engineers. That's it. Yeah. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> yeah, if it was easy, you could buy them at Walmart. <laughs> That's it. And it would just run. <laughs> and actually sitting down and figuring out, what do we want to measure? You know, what's actually important to us? What kind of messages do we want to put out that would help somebody that's not us continue to operate the software, to have a hint of where the software is struggling? I think it's a, actually a really long discussion. Well, yeah, and again, of course, it depends on your application. Right. But, you know, if I had to think of several things, uh, if you're a server, then definitely the requests that arrive, right. the time that it takes to, yeah. handle those, uh, mm -hmm. to handle those requests. If you have different types of requests than, sure. than those, um, if you have queues, the size of queues, yeah. if, gosh, if you allocate a lot of objects, then maybe some information about these. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I would think I would probably want to ask the ops guys too, what do you need yes, to see? Definitely. You know? they, they buy them pizza. <laughs> you, you also mentioned that you could do web stuff with this. Is, are we talking about, you know, JavaScript access? Any, any, way, any way to write ETW records from a browser? Um, oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we need to start recording and see what's there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't tried. The monitoring that we do for web, uh, web application is not based on ETW. That's right. Uh, we, have, uh, we have JavaScript uh, well, and you did mention that that, cla that Google's Chrome does yeah, write yeah. ETW entries, but yes. that doesn't mean anything specific about yeah, a web page. Yeah, I, I have I have mm. to admit I don't remember what I saw <laughs> inside. Mm -hmm. uh, probably information about where you're navigating, maybe mm -hmm. the times that certain, maybe time that load takes. I don't yeah. know. Uh, but we don't use ETW for web. Well, we have uh, we have extensions for that. So there's a lot of great stuff just built into the browser tools already. Yeah, you know to monitor that stuff. Um, yeah, there's a whole set of timing classes that were part of the DOM in HTML5 era that got, in, and literally would give you numbers like how long it took to do the DNS lookup, mm. you know, those kind, how mm. long it took to negotiate yes, an SSL it's handshake. Per performance, uh, there's a performance API, mm -hmm. performance timing. Yeah. Um, I don't remember specifically about DNS, but there's a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, numbers there, like the load time, the navigation time, the redirect time, the request time, DOM initialization time. Yeah. Uh, Last time I looked info. at that, admittedly, it was that was back in the strange loop era. Each browser had a different set. Like huh. I'm pretty sure now it's the same, or you at would, least, or at least, hope. or at least the main parts are the same. You would hope. <laughs> yeah, one would hope. I don't know that it's true, but you would hope. The problem is with enterprise. Th with enterprise, though, is that you can't rely on the fact that the latest Chrome and the latest IE have the same features. Yes. Yeah. Um, Much less the latest Safari, which you know. Yeah. Is we not actually late. have a customer who's still running XP. So uh, IE six? Say not IE six. I'm uh, not. No, I'm not sure. Okay. I know it's XP, um, and so it's a problem. And well, yeah. you know, we can't tell a bank will just upgrade your yeah. IE, uh, it's not going to work. Well, and so and we like have to make modifications to our code. Or to lose support. the customer. Yeah, or right. lose the customer. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. really what happens. You're fired. Everything's going to be fine. Well, it's funny because when we're recording this, which is, you know, middle of June, mm. Microsoft, who said that XP is out of support, just yep. pushed out an XP patch. Oh, really? For right. a major I vulnerability. I haven't heard about that. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. And, and it's, it's kind of a kerfuffle. It's like, really? Mm. I thought we were done. Nope. Yeah. 
It's an apparently it's an important. I, I assume it's hard to be Microsoft. There are probably I a lot. There's probably guys. a lot of pressure <laughs> from different places and. Uh, a 16-year-old operating yeah, system. Yeah, on the one yeah. hand, they want to move forward and yeah. stop supporting Windows XP, but then, you know, like, what if they have a bank? Yeah. And there's a security vulnerability. What, what are you going to do, really? Was it Windows XP that introduced USB? No, the first version of XP, I was just didn't telling the story, have USB. didn't have USB. Yeah. We got USB as of SP2. Right. Which was a couple, three years later. So we got yeah. a security update and... USB. That's right. And, <laughs> and a big one. Yeah, so here it is. May 15th, a patch for XP SP3 dealing with a specific security issue, but they don't get into the issue. Huh. So, But important enough that they have dragged out a patch for a 16-year-old operating system to get it fixed. Wow. Very, very interesting times. Very cool. So what's on your radar, Dina? What's next for you? What's next for me in what sense? <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to be working on um, when you leave uh, Oslo here? So currently I'm working on our Chrome extension oh, yeah. uh, for monitoring uh, user experience in Chrome. Uh, we're in a performance improvement cycle now. Nice. Um, and it's very interesting actually because we're a performance monitoring tool, right? Mm -hmm. But we need to monitor our own performance. Right. Interesting. Yeah, what it and costs you to yeah, do those measurements. Like, you know, I wrote a Chrome extension. Mm. It runs in the page you no know, context. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a single thread in JavaScript. Yep. Like generally, um, obviously, it's going to affect the website, and I, I need and experience. I need to measure that effect. And sure. I can't use myself because that's sure. what I'm, you know, monitor uh, want to measure. Um, so it's really interesting to think about first of all what you want to measure. Yeah. I mean, what does it mean to slow down the page? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we divided that into slowing down the load process, the load time, which is actually very easy because there are events in the time yeah, APA run. of load start and load end, yeah. and actually measuring the impact on load is very easy. So that was the first task that we did. Um, but then there's the measuring the general page performance, mm -hmm. like how does it feel to the user right. uh, when our extension is running? it is a feeling rather than the actual hard time. Mm. So, I mean, if you want to go uh, scientifically about it, you have to come up with concrete, uh, measurable metrics sure. mm. uh, that you Render want times. that mm. you want to to measure, and and, and then you know, then you have to write the code that measures it. Um, so we came up with different things. Um, we're still experimenting with that mm -hmm. um, because it's not always clear that these metrics really re represent the feeling that the yeah. user has sure, absolutely. when wh you know sure. when uh, when using the website. So it's a really interesting. Task. You also got a challenge with the extension model itself because it not only provides impact but often. There are more than one extension running. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. And that's going to interact. Of course, definitely. Although um, we do measure our extension, um, you know, um, by in itself, a, in in a by a itself sandbox, because yeah. because they're first of all they're sandbox from one yep. from one another. Um, of course, the the uh, the effect adds up. So if I have a hundred extensions. It's, you know, if you have 100 it extensions, might you need to <laughs> stop doing well, that. Depends, <laughs> too many it extensions. Depends, it depends what they do. But, sure. like, for example, an, an ad blocker right. yeah. is something pretty invasive. It, like, actually goes over Removing the entire... Removing pieces from the page. Yeah, yeah. It, it does stuff to the page. For sure. So that, along with maybe a password... Um, uh, yep. uh, Your saver, last pass, yeah. one pass, that kind right. of thing. Stuff like that. So that can add up. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we read whatever is going on on the page and, yep. and we register on the user events and clicks and keyboard. Uh, sure. Uh, so, so that adds up, but we do measure just whatever we do. I mean, right. if somebody installs another extension and it adds up on top of ours, it's, right. it's sad, of course, but well, they I'm only responsible they for... Chrome. <laughs> I'm only responsible for what we do. Because again, they don't interact. Yeah. So sure. it's a little different. Shouldn't <laughs> interact. They're yeah. all consuming memory on <laughs> yes, the same machine. Yes. Guys yeah. got too many copies of Chrome open. Wait, I'm describing myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, actually, actually it's, it's good that you mentioned that because uh, when I was measuring load times, mm -hmm. Basically, what I did was write a loop that reloaded my page over and over again and reported all the results sure. to a server or whatever, to a log file. And I noticed that the load times 
they slowly, slowly go up. They got with, longer. The, longer with time. Right. Okay. And Memory it was leak? really weird, right? Yeah. I mean, it's the same page, it's the same extension, the same configuration. What's going on? Mm. And it also depended. Like, if I wanted to test a larger page, then it would go up. Uh, faster. Much faster, right? Mm. And if it was a small page, then you know I would see the effect only about two thousand uh, repeats right. of my test. And so eventually, what I found out is that if I add a delay between each run, my results became flat. So is wow. there something? Um I'm guessing. Asynchronous going on there, maybe? So, no, I'm guessing. You know, I mean, after all, it's, you know, we're using Chrome. Yeah, you're And when web pages, they allocate memory, and, you yeah. know, there's DOM and stuff like that. And so what I figured eventually is that when my loop, my test is ran in such a tight loop, right. just Chrome doesn't get the time to, to calm it's down. Yeah, to kind yeah, of it's calm down. Collection. So I didn't you know, test it. I right. I'm, mm. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I was thinking, that's that it's probably garbage collection. And so I had to like dial add, down. Add uh, that delay, gives yeah. it time to collect yes. the garbage, and yes. now you have consistent, repeatable, yes. same yes. measurements. Yeah. That's yes. pretty cool. That's the yes. same thing you did with your database thing. Uh, I've done a few things like sort that. Sort of like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, this has been a fascinating hour, and uh, thanks for being here with us, Tina. Thank you for having me. It was great fun. Absolutely. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC.